Leicester Square, the heart of London's film land. And tonight is a very special occasion. The stars are arriving in abundance, not for a premiere, the usual reason, but because tonight they're honouring one of their number. The Vice President of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts is Sir Richard Attenborough. Earlier, I asked Sir Richard to explain the significance of this evening. Uh, our Academy, BAFTA, uh, is meeting to honour one of our most distinguished members uh, for his contribution to cinema in the first of uh, an annual event, uh, which is uh, an award to be presented by Her Royal Highness Princess Royal. And uh, the recipient, as you know, is Dirk Bogart. Academy of Film and Television Arts, in association with Shell UK, presents for the first time a tribute award to an actor or actress who has made an outstanding contribution to world cinema. BAFTA Tribute Award is an actor whose accomplishments make most of us in this business look like beginners. Dirk Bogard, or Derek Niven van den Bogard, was born in Hampstead in 1921. His mother was a Scottish actress, Margaret Niven. His Anglo-Dutch father, Ulrich van den Bogard, was the first art editor of the Times newspaper. He went to school in Scotland and then studied art at the Chelsea Polytechnic. But it was theatre that lured him away and his first fully professional job was at the Q Theatre, West London, cleaning the gents' loos. He's never looked back. Let's welcome him. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, Dirk Bogard. some of the high spots of Dirk's early film career, of an actor who was later to become the idol of the Odeon. Where did you pick that one? <laughs> I'm Bill Fox. Really? I'm the Speedway star. How interesting. I've never known a Speedway star before. What are you called when you're done? My name? Dorothy Elizabeth. My intimates call me Dotty Liz. That's very nice. How many of those have you got? I never had much of a head for figures. How could a man responsible for his actions do such a hopeless, desperately stupid thing as this man? When they found him, he was trying to walk home to England. He might just as well have tried to kill a German trench single-handed. Suddenly, I want to weep, but I must hold my tears in trick, lest they think it is myself I weep for. And who would weep for Sidney Carton? A little time ago, none in all the world. But somebody will weep for me now. And that knowledge redeems a worthless life. final moment, which makes it all worthwhile. It is 
is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. I do hate growing old. It all started for me just after the war, at least after my war, in 1947. I came back to England, got a job in a small play outside London, which was seen by, in those days, a very important impresario called Peter Daubeny, who brought it into the West End, and by some miracle, I was seen by a film director and producer called Ian Dalrymple. And really that's why you're all here tonight, because that's why I'm here tonight. Dirk, we have someone who was with you in your early days at Rank, and she's flown in especially from Los Angeles. Jean Simmons. And she went off to Hollywood and it was called So Long at the Fair and wait till we hear our voices and see our dear little faces. I really must go into another hotel or something. There's no need to, you know, you can stay here. I couldn't do that. It's all right, I shan't be here. I've taken my friend's room over at your hotel. I'm staying there for the night. Have you found something else? I think I've got a lead. The first thing we've got to do is to prove that there was a room 19. Do you doubt it? No, no, I believe they deliberately changed the numbers around. What is now room 20 used to be room 19. I don't see how we can prove it. Well, when I was at the hotel this afternoon, there was a man paying his bill at the desk. The manager gave him a receipt from a book with counterfoils. Now, we've got to get hold of that book. And if it's got the counterfoils of room 19 in it, you go straight to the police, and this time they listen to you. Well, how do we get the book? I don't know, but I'm going to get it. Will it be dangerous? Good heavens, I hope not. Why? Well, I, I don't like the thought of you running such risks, this. There's no reason why you should. Isn't there? I can think of quite a few of it. Well, Dirk went onwards and upwards to marvellous films and a tremendous career. And we all know what a wonderful actor he is. Bogard's seven-year contract with Rank lasted from 1947 until 1962. Uh, but that's because every time they lent him out to the theatre, which was six months of every year, the time was added to his original contract. I don't think he realised that at the time. He made a lot of films then, some good, some indifferent, some forgotten. But from the 50s to the 60s, he was the number one male British and European star with enormous box office appeal. And producers made the, according to Dirk, reluctant discovery that the Bogard presence could greatly enhance the performance of an otherwise indifferent film. And that even further restricted his freedom of choice. Of course, not all films fell into this category. Here are just a few of his most popular appearances. I don't believe in God or in the church, but I did believe that in you I'd met a completely good man, and because of that, I who trusted no one, trusted you. You have broken your word. And you are an expert gardener. I can dig and help, care for the soil, prune and plant, but I'm not so expert. 
You remember you asked me once what I was doing in Come Lucky? Yes. Well, there is a reason. I was trying to make up for what my father did. Your father? Yes. He was Stuart Campbell's partner. Oh. He got away with the money and your grandfather went to jail. Oh, I'm not defending him. I can't. But, Jean, it was a long time ago. No, please let me say it. All those years in England at school, and afterwards having a whale of a time, it was all being paid for by the people of Cumberland. Every cent. Dirk Bogard was a photographic intelligence officer, went to France on D-Day, crossed the Rhine on his 24th birthday, and later went to India and the Far East. Not surprisingly, in many of his films he was put into uniform. One was They Who Dare, made by the veteran American director of All Quiet on the Western Front, Louis Milestone. Dirk's comrade-at-arms in that film, Denim Elliott. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Dirk and I were involved in this war film. It was in 1850, uh, 1950, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Only maybe, but not like <laughs> Dirk was a rather twitchy lieutenant, and I was a rather gormless um, a sergeant, if I remember. Very brave, sir. Yes, very, very brave. <laughs> Not very athletic. Not very well. The film was called They Who Dare, and when it came out, the critics called it How Dare They. <laughs> it's true. We were frightfully upset because we had tried awfully hard. <laughs> anyway, it was finished off in the studio with a facsimile of the beach that had been working over the enormous papier-mâché rocks and of course I fell through up to the neck, looked like Tweedledum or something. Quite... You, were, you were terribly cross, you were filthy cross. It was a very, I, I might say it's a very athletic film and um, I was rather good at jumping over aeroplanes. I wasn't very good at the acting but I could do, do the aeroplane bombing. Dan couldn't do them very well and got cross. <laughs> and he kept saying, I'm, I, I'm a bloody actor, I'm not an acrobat. <laughs> <laughs> And then he jumped up and on the rock and it went through and he disappeared. <laughs> and there was nothing. We heard this voice saying, I am not an acrobat! <laughs> I'm an actor! And I won the Bancroft Medal at RADA! <laughs> This is what it looked like. How dare they? Oh, you got me as it now. <laughs> <laughs> they who dare. You're quite a chap, Corcoran. Yeah. Thanks to the army. But you'll never make a soldier. Yeah. What time is it? 2310. The sub was due at 2300 hours. You should be down on the beach and see the lagging mirror out the countryside. Signaling. That's where we're going. But if there is one film from Dirk Bogard's early career that not only provided him with his first really satisfying part, but enabled him to demonstrate his acting capabilities, it was The Blue Lamp in 1950. Blue Lamp was made by one of the most underrated British directors we have, or had, Basil Dill. And I'd worked with him before, just when the war started, uh, in a small play at the Kew Theatre, and he was the director. I went on to take over from somebody else, and he said, oh my God, the war really has started, they're rationing the talent. <laughs> but we progressed, and we went on to do The Blue Lamp. The Blue Lamp was a film that we did try to make tribute to the police force as it was in those days. It was a different police force and they were Dicks and Docks, Doc Greens. We tried to make a cinema verite, which was Basil's deep idea from Ealing, that the 
the thing should be as real as possible. We shot in the streets that all it means. Then, in 1948, 49, it was terribly new. And no one knew that we were doing this. We, we did an escape during a Greyhound race or meeting at the White City, the old White City. No one in that huge place knew we were shooting a movie. They knew a cop was chasing me. And all the audience and all the reaction was real and was true. Well, let's see that scene. The Blue Lamp, directed by Basil Dearden, 1950.